Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our annual Martin Luther King celebration. We will now have the playing of our Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Ooh. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies resound. has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day because march on till victory is won stony the road we trod into the chastening rock felt in the Again, welcome and thank you for attending our annual celebration to commemorate the visit of Dr. Martin Luther King to St. Francis College. We will now have our welcome from our illustrious president, James Herbert. Thank you so much, Erica. Good evening, my name is James Herbert and I'm the president of the University of New England. So welcome to our annual event honoring the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This event is one of the highlights each year for our community and it provides an occasion for us to pay homage to Dr. King and to reaffirm our individual as well as our collective commitments to carrying on the work that he so valiantly championed. And though I wish we could be together in person like we usually are, I'm very glad that everyone could join us for this event virtually this year. Through the years, this series has offered us incredible opportunities to meet and learn from speakers like the iconic civil rights activist, Angela Davis, and politician and activist, Stacey Abrams, who, as I'm sure you're no doubt aware, just made history through her work to protect voter rights. Her work contributed to the registration of tens of thousands of previously unregistered voters, which is widely credited for changing the outcome of the recent presidential and US Senate races in her home state of Georgia. Shortly, we'll hear from this year's speaker, UNE's very own David Livingstone Smith, who will present a lecture titled, From Race to Dehumanization. Dr. Smith is one of the world's foremost experts in dehumanization, and we all have much to learn from him. But first, I invite us all to reflect on the seminal event this series commemorates and on its lasting impact on our UNE community. In May of 1964, as Dr. King led the fight for racial justice and equality, he, his travels brought him here to Biddeford, where he was greeted by an overflowing crowd right in DeCary Hall. This would be his only trip to Maine. He came in response to an invitation from two St. Francis College faculty members. And for those of you who may not know, St. Francis was our precursor institution here in Biddeford, right on this campus. Now to put this in perspective, 
Dr. King visited our campus less than a year after his famous I Have a Dream speech, and the very year he would win the Nobel Prize and be named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. That's to say, he visited our forebears at the very height of his influence and fame. He spoke that day about the importance of principled, peaceful, civil disobedience and the dire need to end racial segregation in America. He spoke about inequality in America and the need to ensure that all Americans have equal opportunity to live happy, successful lives. He highlighted his vision for a day when race would no longer be the defining feature of any person's life. Afterwards, he mingled with students, faculty, and community members. That day, some 57 years ago, came at a special moment for the people of Maine and the United States more broadly, a moment in time when long-awaited, desperately needed, needed changes in our society seemed suddenly tangible and within reach. And yet so much work remained then as now to make Dr. King's glorious vision a reality. The year just passed, 2020, will be remembered, of course, for the pandemic that ravaged our world. But just as importantly, it will be remembered for the racial reckoning that occurred in cities and towns across America. It was a brutal summer for those of us committed to this work, but also a hopeful one. On the one hand, we all bore witness, seemingly again and again, to the senseless brutalizing and killing of our black and brown brothers and sisters. And yet amid this horror and ugliness and national shame, there arose a response that suggested that this time things just might be different, that this time real systemic change may actually be within reach. As multi-generational and multi-racial crowds of protesters assembled in communities across the country to peacefully express that these injustices must not continue, we inched ever closer to the vision awaiting Dr. King atop that mountain. The urgency of the moment was clear to see and to feel. It was palpable, coursing through America's streets. Unprecedented numbers of our fellow citizens learned, perhaps for the first time, painful truths about our nation, our history, and our institutions. We realized it's not enough merely to avoid racist behavior, but that truly realizing the promise of America that Dr. King so eloquently articulated requires all of us to actively embrace anti-racism. Those of us participating in the struggle for our nation's soul came through the summer more united and more committed than ever to the cause of true social and economic justice. And we've gained new allies in the process. So I, for one, am hopeful, certainly not naive, but, but hopeful. Over the course of that long, hot summer, I was especially proud to hear from so many UNE students, members of the faculty, and members of our professional staff who assembled in support of racial and economic justice on our campuses and in their home communities across the country. But I wasn't surprised. We Nor'easters have a long history of advocating for justice. So it made sense that our students, our faculty, our professional staff, would be stepping up as leaders in their communities. Racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination still exist in America. We, we all see that, we acknowledge that, and we affirm our commitment to advocating for change. We at UNE have redoubled our efforts to lead by example. We live in a diverse society and believe our campuses should reflect the full, written, full richness of that diversity. And as such, each year, we continue to refine our student recruitment efforts to reach as broad a demographic and cultural base of students as possible and to introduce them to our amazing community. And we continue to attract students from increasingly diverse backgrounds as a result. We have also created a campus-wide committee for community equity and diversity, which is currently working in coordination with grassroots efforts across campus on several important initiatives to realize the commitment our strategic plan makes to ensuring that UNE is a welcoming, inclusive, and vibrant community. This past year, we also completed our campus climate survey, and we held many robust community meetings to discuss its findings, their implications, and how we can do better. And we hired UNE's first ever Associate Provost for Community Equity and Diversity, Dr. Chris Hunt. Dr. Hunt 
who's now leading our efforts in this area, has quickly become an indispensable voice among my leadership team. Thank you, Chris. We're all grateful for your guidance and your expertise. There's still so much work to do at UNE and in society more widely. And we hope the people whose lives we touch through this lecture series and through our other efforts will help us create the more inclusive and more just society Dr. King envisioned. It's now my pleasure to introduce UNE's Director of Intercultural Student Engagement, Erica Rousseau. For years now, Ms. Rousseau has worked to make this series successful and impactful. And I'll now leave it to her to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. Good evening. Again, my name is Erica Rousseau and I'm the Director of Intercultural Student Engagement here at University of New England. I wanna first acknowledge the Wabanaki Nation, which include the Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy peoples on whose ancient and sacred land we live, work, and play. As a community, we recognize the ever-present systemic inequities that stem directly from past wrongdoings, and we commit ourselves indefinitely to respecting and reconciling this long history of injustice. I'd like to thank the many people who helped in making this event successful. They ensured that once again, this event remain open to the public and accessible to all. I'd like to express a special debt of gratitude to our UNE communications department who work tirelessly to ensure the success of this event every year. Thank you. Today is a day of celebration. This afternoon, we inaugurated a new president and this country's first black and Asian woman vice president. Um, Place. This evening, <laughs> we will commemorate Dr. King's visit to what was then St. Francis College, as Dr. Herber said. We will continue the work by educating ourselves and pushing this nation forward. Thank you to everyone in attendance tonight. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to listen, celebrate, and push forward. Today, we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's visit to what is now the University of New England. I want us to remember though that Dr. King was a controversial man. He is not the beloved figure that history paints him as. He was a radical revolutionary. He demanded change, preached of hope and organized thousands. As he said, he who passively accepts evil is as much involved in it as he who helps to perpetuate it. He who accepts evil without protesting against it is really cooperating with it. And yet Dr. King didn't fight alone. There were many who contributed to the civil rights movement. They lent their gifts to empower and redistribute. I wanna speak briefly about one woman in particular, a lesser known hero or better yet, she wrote, Georgia Gilmore. I first heard about Miss Gilmore when I lived in Alabama. Georgia Gilmore, the Montgomery cook, midwife, and activist whose secret kitchen fed the civil rights movement. When King and others held meetings of the Montgomery Improvement Association at the Holt Street Baptist Church, Gilmore was there selling fried chicken sandwiches and other foods to the African-American men and women gathered there who'd pledge not to use the city's buses until they were desegregated. Gilmore poured those profits back into the movement. As John T. Edge recounts in his book, The Pot Liquor Papers, a, hist a food history of the modern South. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the process, her home kitchen became a locus of change. Gilmore organized black women to sell pound cakes and sweet potato pies, fried fish and stewed greens, pork chops and rice at beauty salons, cab stands and churches. She offered these women of whose grandmothers were born into slavery, a way to contribute to the cause that would not raise suspicions of white employers who might fire them from their jobs or white landowners who might evict them from the houses they rented. The money they raised helped pay for the alternative transportation system that arose in Montgomery during the 381-day bus boycott. 
hundreds of cars, trucks, and wagons that ferry Black workers to and from jobs across towns each day. Gilmore's cooking helped pay for the insurance, gas, wagons, and vehicle repairs that kept that system going. She called the group of women who worked with her in this project the club from nowhere, because as Betty Gilmore, Georgia's sister, told Edge years later, it was like, where did this money come from? It came from nowhere. Gilmore would attend MIA meetings at the church and announce how much she'd raised that week, eventually inspiring another group of women in town to start a similar endeavor. In February 1956, a Montgomery County grand jury indicted King and dozens of other boycott leaders for unlawful conspiracy. Gilmore was among those who testified at King's trial. As late Reverend Al Dixon told NPR in 2005, everybody could tell you Georgia Gilmore didn't take no jump. You pushed her too far, she would say a few bad words. You pushed her any farther, you would get hit. Gilmore brought that fighting spirit to the courtroom. She fearlessly denounced the white bus driver who had picked, kicked her off a city bus from their witness stand. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I paid my fare and they got the money, they don't know Negro money from white money, she told the judge. The testimony made Gilmore a hero to local Blacks, Edge says, but in the white world, she became a pariah. Gilmore lost her job as a cook at the National Lunch Company. Though Edge says it's unclear whether she was fired or she resigned, knowing her testimony would lead to her dismissal. King lived a few blocks from Gilmore and was a fan of her cooking and her activism. Whenever VIPs would come to town, he would always um, have Miss Gilmore cook up a batch of chicken. Nelson Malden, King's one-time barber in Montgomery, recalled in a 2005 interview with NPR, when she was fired from her restaurant job, Reverend King said, well, why don't you go into business for yourself? So she did. With King's support, Gilmore turned her house into an informal restaurant. Robert F. Kennedy came. Lyndon B. Johnson had been there. Dr. King brought them. Gilmore's son, Mark Gilmore, who died in 2008, told NPR in 2005. Gilmore's house became a clubhouse for King, Edge writes, and often the first stop for people in the civil rights movement who visited Montgomery. When King arrived in Montgomery during the 1965 March from Selma, he beelined to Gilmore's kitchen for pork chops. Gilmore died on the 25th anniversary of the Civil Rights March from Selma. She'd spent the morning preparing chicken and macaroni and cheese to feed people marching in observation of the anniversary. Her family served that food to those who came to mourn her. Today, I want to give honor to Georgia Gilmore with her fortitude, entrepreneurship, and some good soul food. The civil rights movement flourished. She was a queen that fed a king. As Ms. Gilmore did, many of us continue to use our gifts to push the urgency of social justice, anti-racism, and equity forward. Dr. David Livingstone Smith is a shining example of such a person. David Livingstone Smith is a professor of philosophy at the University of New England. He has written or edited nine books. His 2011, <clears throat> excuse me, his 2011 Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave, and Exterminate Others won the 2012 Annis Field Wolf Award for Nonfiction. Nicknamed the Black Pulitzer Prize, this award is reserved for books that have made important contributions to our understanding of racism, and human diversity. David's most recent book on humanity, on inhumanity, dehumanization and how to resist it was published by Oxford University Press in 2020. And his 10th book, Making Monsters, The Uncanny Power of Dehumanization will be published by Harvard University Press later this year. David as recently described in the Times Literary Supplement as a philosopher seeking not just to interpret the world, but to change it. His book on inhumanity is praised by Harvard University philosopher Cornel West 
as a philosophically sophisticated and prophetically courageous treatment of dehumanization, especially in regard to race. And Yale University historian Timothy Snyder as firm but gentle, wise but accessible. And University of Pennsylvania law professor Dorothy Roberts says that on inhumanity brilliantly provides a shilling warning of repeating the past and a hopeful call to create a more humane future. And science journalist Angela Sinai calls it a chilling, comprehensive, and passionate account of dehumanization. And as that Smith offers a devastating reminder of the capacity of every human to treat other humans as lesser. David is an interdisciplinary scholar whose publications are cited not only by other philosophers, but also by historians, legal scholars, psychologists, and anthropologists. He has been featured in primetime television documentaries, is often interviewed and citing in the national and international media, and was a guest at the 2012 G20 Economic Summit. We will follow Dr. David Livingstone Smith's um, keynote with a brief question and answer that you can post in the chat at any time. Please help me welcome Dr. David Livingstone Smith. Thank you so much, Erica. Y'all can hear me, right? Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, I wanna thank everyone for, for inviting me to give this, this talk, to thank uh, Erica and James and, and Chris and everyone who's involved and the folks behind the scene making this happen technologically. Um, one, of the, one of the hazards of giving a talk like this, which is not my usual routine talk, ever since my last book came out, I've been averaging one book talk a week and I have a shtick, but this is not a, a routine talk. One of the hazards is you either don't say enough or you, or you say too much. So I will try to strike a happy medium not go long on um, longer than my allotted time. Uh, and certainly I'm in no danger actually, uh, uh, come to think of it in, in saying too little. Part of the context of a talk is important. It provides some, some of the meaning of what the speaker says. And our context is an historically poignant moment. Just two weeks ago, a group of men and women stormed our capital, carrying Confederate flags and anti-Semitically inscribed shirts. And of course, now today we've had 25,000 National Guardsmen making sure that the inauguration of our new president goes off without violence. But as President Biden said today in what I thought was a, a really excellent speech, excellent because he did not minimize the problems confronting us. The fight against these forces is an ongoing struggle. And in particular, he mentioned the fight against white supremacism. So many of us are in a giddy mood. President Trump is gone. Others see that as a tragedy. But those of us who are in a giddy mood should not deceive ourselves that the problems have gone away. We shouldn't deceive ourselves to think that the arrests of these people, the FBI have been very active, solves the problem. This is, as Biden emphasized, this is a long haul thing. And it's something that our country needs to address and has needed to address for centuries. Right? This is not some new phenomenon. This is simply a manifestation of fundamental current in American life. You know, I often hear people say, particularly politicians, of the recent events, that's not who we are. Well, it is who we are. That's not who we are is meaningless. And it, it takes us away from addressing the problems we need to address. 
rather than taking us towards them. And often I hear politicians say that the United States was founded on these wonderful ideals that we have somehow fallen short of. Well, that too is not quite right because in order to address the problems this nation needs to address, we have to appreciate that the current of white supremacism is not some accidental failing. It represents something very important about the history of our nation. It's not simply uh, an oversight or a lack. It's something that many people over centuries have actively striven for and many people actively strive for to this day. Now here I'm speaking as a philosopher, a representative of the humanistic disciplines. And I think one of the great ironies and indeed tragedies of this current historical moment is that the disciplines who are best situated to address meaningfully these problems are some of the most marginalized in this nation. Without an understanding of history, the present becomes unintelligible because the, the, his, the present is constituted by the, the past. What's going on now is simply the most recent page of a long book and gets its meaning from what's gone before it. So historical awareness, absolutely vital and, and terribly lacking in, in, for, for very, very many American citizens. The, the enhancement and development of our imaginative capacities, which the study of literature teaches us, which the study of literature cultivates in us is also vital. How often have I heard students say, when I'm addressing something of great moral concern, that, well, it doesn't really affect them, so they don't think about it. And finally, there is philosophy, which teaches us to think and reason courageously and precisely, and to ask very awkward questions and to be like Socrates advocated, a gadfly, an irritant to those who would prefer to close their eyes. So, this is a part of who we are. And it has been that way for a long time. It was that way in 1790, when not to become a naturalized citizen, Congress decided one had to be a white man. It was that way in 1924, when the, the racist immigration act tried to exclude those primarily from Europe actually, who were thought to be members of inferior races, Southern Europeans, Eastern Europeans, Jews. It was not by accident that the National Socialists, the Nazis, during the early days of their regime, looked to the United States for guidance for becoming a racist state because the United States was, as the uh, historian James Whitman puts it, a world leader in racism. In fact, the Nazis sent a team of lawyers over to study our Jim Crow laws so they could emul emulate them in the Nuremberg laws, which were of course the first step on the road to Auschwitz. But ironically and sadly and importantly, the Nazis thought the Americans were too extreme in their racism, that our laws were too harsh. Think of that for a moment. Likewise, many Americans appreciated what the Nazis were doing. If you've never seen it, I would encourage you all to Google A Night at the Garden, which is a film filmed in 1938 of a meeting of 20,000 American Nazis in Madison Square Garden. It's quite breathtaking. 
So this is a very deep thing. Um, and our, our racial history, and this is something I try so hard to convey to students who are never really taught this properly, or the history of the notion of race generally, is so laden with pain, with suffering, with brutality. I think the word injustice is too pale a word to capture what has gone on in the name of race. Let me talk to you for a minute about an example of racial brutality that I often discuss in my work. And I'll come back to it towards the end, provided I don't go on too long. This was the lynching of Henry Smith in 1893. The lynching of Henry Smith in Waco, Texas is regarded by many as the first example of a spectacle lynching in the United States. Spectacle lynchings, which continued well into the 20th century, there were people who attended those lynchings in living memory now, who are alive now. Spectacle lynchings were publicly advertised lynchings that attracted thousands of spectators, many thousands of spectators. Most Americans think of lynching as the way it's presented in the movies, which is a half a dozen Ku Klux Klan guys ride up on horses and string a black man up. Well, those things did happen, but spectacle lynchings were something else entirely. So let me tell you about Henry Smith's spectacle lynching. Henry Smith was a mentally disabled farm worker. He was accused of murdering and raping a four-year-old child. He was apprehended in Arkansas, allegedly confessed on the train ride back, I imagine under torture if there was a confession. Back in Waco, there were festivities. The saloons were closed, the schools were closed, families brought their children to watch this man first being paraded around the town on a float, a carnival float, and then led to a platform where he was tortured for hours. Skin was burnt off of him. His eyes were gouged out with hot irons. And then he was burnt alive on a pile of cotton husks. If, as if that was not bad enough, his body parts were taken as souvenirs. The crowd pressed in. A professional photographer was on hand to take pictures, which were sold as postcards. Lynching postcards were common all over the South. This was not a one-off. Many of these events took place. That is our legacy. When I speak to students, they have a vague, what I call the cartoon version of the history of race. First there was slavery and maybe it wasn't that bad. And then there was Jim Crow, they're not quite clear what that means, but it has something to do with sitting on the back of a bus. And then there is the civil rights movement. And I guess now we can add now the Black Lives Matter movement, but that is a very thin and very bowdlerized account. So this is very serious business. And this is what I devote my, this is my work. I'm interested in race, I'm interested in racism, and I'm interested in dehumanization, which I describe in my most recent book as racism on steroids. So part of my approach to this is the claim which many who have not studied this or who've not been exposed to it, and that's most people, will find incredible. I mean, the first claim is that generally speaking, almost everyone who has studied race rejects that races are valid biological taxonomic categories. What's going on in race in the attributions of race is not biology. Medical science is very much behind on this. Medical science still keeps race around, but the, the geneticists and the biologists and people in all sorts of other disciplines 
who seriously engage with this, it's almost a consensus that race is a social invention. I'll get into that a little bit more deeply in a moment. Second, I hold, and others do too, this is really central to my work, that racism is baked into race. They're not separable. We can't adopt and give credence to race without giving credence to racism, even if we try really hard. And the reason we can't is that race is a basically hierarchical notion. Races are invented, they're generated in the course of history in the service of domination and oppression. We can see this time and time and time again, from the racialization of Jews in the Middle Ages to the racialization of West Africans much later, centuries later, and so on. So although race is not generally regarded by those who know as a valid biological scientific category, it has an extraordinary grip on the human imagination. But because it is so toxic, I think we need to make our best efforts to get over it, to get over racism. To get over racism, we have to get over race. And as dehumanization is founded on race, almost always people are racialized. They're treated as an alien and inferior race as a first step to thinking of them as subhuman creatures. If we want to get rid of dehumanization, and dehumanization is responsible for some of the worst atrocities that human beings have perpetrated on one another, we need to get rid of race. So let me very briefly, and indeed somewhat dogmatically, given the constraints of time, talk to you about what I, how I think the idea of race works. Now, one of the obstacles that confronts people who are trying to theorize race, trying to think about the, the properties of this, this notion is to be too local, to take one example and base one's analysis on that. But of course, race is broad. It's found, the idea of race is found all over and in various historical periods. So minimally, let's just take two. Whatever account we give for what it is to regard people as belonging to a race, it's got to at least encompass the, exa the, the example of the racialization of Africans, the idea of a black race, and the racialization of Jews. Let's speak, pick a period during the Third Reich in Germany. Now, if you think of that for a moment, you realize it can't be that to think of others as belonging to a certain race is constituted by how they look. So let's go to two cases. One is the United States. The idea of passing as white would be unintelligible if racial membership was about appearance. Similarly, it's not by accident that the Nazis forced Jewish people to wear yellow stars because that's the only way they could tell. They couldn't tell by eyeballing people that they were Jews. You were a Jew in virtue of your pedigree. You know, the, you had to have, well, it's, it's complicated laws involved there, but uh, the number of your grandparents who were Jews determined if you were a Jew or not. And you see that was less extreme than the American one drop rule. That's the Nazis thought the American one drop rule was crazy. Um, so what is going on in both those cases and many other cases and even cases where the term race isn't used but the same sort of thing is going on? Well, I think there are three components to race, to thinking of people as belonging to races. One is the idea that there are a small number of fundamentally different types of people. Fundamentally different types of people. And that everyone alive is either a pure specimen of one of these types or a mixture of two or more of them. Now, of course, right away, that does not make biological sense at all. Typological thinking in biology went out decades ago. 
Second, what makes someone a member of one of these categories of people is something deep within them. It's not their appearance, although their appearance might be diagnostic. You might conclude someone is white by looking at them. But you might be wrong. They might be passing as white. What's supposed to make someone a member of a racial category is what the psychologists who has done wonderful work on this topic have called an essence. Something deep, it's often imagined to be located in the blood or bodily fluids. Just as an aside, both in Nazi Germany and the American Red Cross segregated blood supplies during the 40s. That this idea of blood is needed to explain that. The racial essence is carried in the blood. So God forbid you would get a blood transfusion and you got the wrong kind of race blood. Well, what's that gonna to do to you then? You're gonna be contaminated. Finally, there's the notion of inferiority and superiority. Those regarded as a member of an alien race are thought to have less intrinsic value. Their lives don't matter or don't matter as much as our lives do. Now that's a pattern, that's a robust pattern. We can find it across cultures, we can find it across historical periods. It, re it, it reproduces itself relentlessly. There's, there are reasons why that is the case having to do with human psychology, which I don't have the time to describe to you now. Read my books, <laughs> read on in humanity, you'll get the story there. I mentioned a little while ago that um, race, racial thinking, racial beliefs, racial ideologies are a foundation for dehumanization. You see, when people are racialized, they're thought of as being a second race, an inferior kind of human being, but still a human being. That's ordinary race, racism. That's ordinary racism. Yeah, they're human, but they're kind of crappy. They've got these, they they're, they're, they're just don't have the same worth as we do, as we, whoever we is, place ourselves at the, the top of the human hierarchy. In the 18th century, this was formal, right? They had little hierarchical diagrams in which white Europeans modestly placed themselves at the pinnacle of humanity. Um, but in dehumanization, which is really the main object of my research. Those others, those racialized others are excluded from the category of the human altogether. They're beasts, they're vermin, they're monsters, they're demons. And this licenses a kind of brutality towards them, which would otherwise be difficult to muster. So let me return to Henry Smith for just a moment. This man, when I described, and I described rather vaguely, actually, in a rather fuzzy way, the atrocities that he was subjected to, as so many other Black Americans were, the thousands. And you might ask yourself, and you would ask yourself all the more if I had presented the details here, the excerpts from newspapers describing the event and books written by witnesses to the event, you would ask yourself, how could people do that to another human being? Well, part of the answer was in their eyes, and this legitimated their treatment in their eyes, Henry Smith and many others were not human beings. One of the things I like to do when I research uh, lynchings is to go to newspaper reports of, of the day and Look at how the victims were described. Here are a few examples from the Henry Smith, reports on the Henry Smith lynching, which by the way, were almost to the anniversary it was. It was uh, February 1st, 1893. The San Antonio Gazette called Smith a black beast. The St. Louis Gazette called him a bestial Negro. Bishop, bishop Haygood, who was a, a uh, Methodist bishop, described the crime as saying that the child was torn asunder 
in the mad wantonness of gorilla ferocity. A man named Vance, who wrote a book about this, um, Vance was the, the father of the murdered child. He was the sheriff, the, the Waco sheriff, said that Smith was devoid of any humanizing sensibilities. And two other newspaper descriptions, two other of many, many, these are like typical, right? Or the black brute whose carnival of blood and lust has brought death and desolation and fiendish beast. So you can go to many of these lynchings, you read these accounts, you read the scientific literature of the day, which was of course scientific racist literature, and you find African Americans being described as quite literally an alien species and a disgusting and horrible alien species, and the religious literature uh, describing uh, African Americans as satanic, as demonic, um, and depictions in, in fiction as well. And when, by the time we get to 1916 in the cinema with the birth of a nation, which by the way, just a little point, was uh, one of the most racist films of all time. It was partially responsible for the, the revival of the Ku Klux Klan in 1916 and was screened initially in the White House President Wilson, who was a, a, a Southerner who resegregated the federal government. And he allegedly endorsed the film as great history. Wilson was an historian. So that's just one example of many of how racialization, racial thinking, racial beliefs, racial ideology set the stage. I mean, they're horrible enough but set the stage for even greater horrors of dehumanization. And that's why I think we need to get rid of race. Thank you. I knew this was gonna be good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. David Livingstone Smith. I, I truly appreciate this. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I, I have a few questions too. I would, was wondering what are your. Okay, I'm sorry, before you start, if, if, if folks could please use the Q&A function instead of the chat for our, our questions tonight, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. And I apologize. I am so rude. This is Dr. Chris Hunt. Um, he is our associate provost, <laughs> um, new to the UNE family. I'm sorry. I forgot my manners tonight. Um, but yes, it is called the Q&A function. Thank you. Um, Speaking of lynchings, um, can you speak to how that has morphed into, I was speaking to students the other day about police and how um, as a black American, I've never seen them as like, oh great, the police are here, everything's gonna be great. Like, because they've played a role as, as terrorists to black folks. Like the, the, on Bloody Sunday in Selma that I spoke about earlier, they were the ones with the water hoses and the, the, the uh, German shepherds attacking people. Um, but can you talk about how lynchings have morphed into the modern day, like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Maude Aubrey, the ones that we don't read about in the paper, though, that, that still happen, Sandra Bland. Um, can you talk about how those things um, look different and maybe how we've been desensitized to them because we have this overload of information. You're on mute, sir. Unmute myself. I like to make a distinction here. Um, and it, it doesn't make what's going on now any prettier. So what what the the police violence against black people, and by the way, against Native Americans, there's a very high, and it doesn't get any reportage um, of uh, police violence against Native Americans. That is state-sponsored state violence. Lynchings were not officially state-sponsored violence, right? They were, they were illicitly endorsed by the state. So, you know, for instance, when it came to trial, uh, the judge would typically say, 
the, the, the person was killed at the hands of persons unknown, even though everyone knew who, who did the killing and the torturing, right? So I see it as a kind of a parallel rather than as a, uh, a new incarnation. And there was, of course, for centuries, state-sponsored violence against racialized people as well. Thank you, sir. Um, I was wondering, as a speaking as a student, and I know you you gave some tips in your speech. Where do we go from here? What what can a student, faculty, staff, people? What can we do to step forward in working for a socially just world and and deracializing, if that's a word? Um, yeah, that's that's. Well, there are many things one can do, and. I think we all have to use whatever strengths we have. There's, there are always things we can do, be it the vote, be it our attitudes to others in our everyday lives and so on. But I, I th here's one thing I think is really, really important. Americans just, the first day of my class on race, racism and beyond here at UNE, I say to my students, it's way worse than you ever imagined. And it's true, they'll all confirm that. The history is all out there. There's a sea of history, but it's not well known. And we have to ask ourselves why it's not well known. And I think it's not well known because it comes into conflict with certain illusions that Americans like to, certainly white Americans, like to sustain about our civilization our notions of American exceptionalism, of being the shining city on the hill, and all that garbage. Um, historical, you see, we've never had to. We weren't like Germany, we weren't brought to our knees and even that didn't, I mean, right-wing extremism is resurgent in Germany, but they've done a hell of a job. We've never had to. And abandoning illusions like that don't come easy. It, it's, it's, humi it's humbling. Um, so as has often been said these days, in truth and reconciliation, truth comes first. It's only recently that lynching has become a federal offense. <laughs> only recently. People tried for decade upon decade. Congress always rejected it. There's, there's a, a lynching memorial in Alabama. I think every site where there is at least a spectacle lynching should be memorialized. And just as children, German children are taken to Auschwitz, school children in the United States should be taken to these sites, right? So people need to learn, they need to act, and there are larger social and political commitments, which I think could really help. But Make no mistake, like I said in the beginning, this problem ain't over. And any efforts along this line is going to be met with very considerable backlash. So it's, it's a long struggle ahead. Thank you, David. We have a really important question, I think, and it's one that I wanted to ask as well. So uh, earlier when you said uh, to get rid of race, uh, are you saying, are you referring to, and this is a wonderful question from uh, Zoe Henderson. Uh, when you say get rid of race, are you referring to colorblindness? No. How, would, how, how would that affect okay. individualism, especially in a school or education setting? If we want people, students to be heard and seen, how do we get, how do we get to that without letting race filter in? Okay, great. That's a great question. Um, and there's a little bit in the original plan talk that was going to address that, but I cut it out in the interest of time. So race is a kind of theory. It's a folk theory. It's a theory that we just absorb from our culture. Like all theories, including fancy scientific ones, it tries to explain what we can observe with reference to something we can't observe. So that's how scientific theories, or if, if we can observe everything, it's not a theory anymore, it's just a description. What does race try to explain? Well, it tries to explain human diversity. 
And it does so, and now I can link back to something I said, by positing that there are a limited number of fundamentally different types of human beings, right? That's the theory bit. Human diversity is an absolute fact, right? And human diverse, geographically linked, human diversity is an absolute fact. But that's not the same as saying there are races. It's not say, the same as saying there are different types of human beings that explain all these wonderful variations in the human family. Um, so I think it's very important to make that distinction. Um, now, there's, there's a related concern there, which is if you're getting rid of race, how do you work for racial justice? Well, I don't think that's a problem, actually. Let's, we don't have to accept that races exist. Races, I just described it, hierarchically ordered, fundamentally different kinds of people. To accept that people have been racialized and are racialized, they're thought of in that way. They're slotted into these hierarchical categories. Um, and we can resist that. Right, so let's give an analogy. Um, centuries ago, many people, mostly women, were accused of being witches, consorting with the devil. They thought to rub ointments on their bodies, fly off once a month to consort with the devil in the form of a black cat. Now, they weren't witches because there aren't any rich witches at least in that sense, right? They were witcherized, so to speak. The great, the Field Sisters, two African-American scholars, wrote a book called Racecraft, specifically modeling their, their approach to the idea of race, which is very similar to mine on this witchcraft thing. Well, the, the women who were accused of being witches, who were believed to be witches, let's suppose their descendants said, we deserve reparations for the brutality that was inflicted on us. That would be absolutely legitimate. But you don't have to accept the existence of witches for that. And so it's the same with race. We don't, we don't have to give in to that. We don't have to accept these categories that were fashioned to oppress people of color. We don't have to buy that. And, if, and without buying that, we can still work for justice. And, and it does not, rejecting race does not mean rejecting one's, the history of one's, one's, one's culture, the, the, the ethnic intricacies of one's culture, nothing like that. Look, I'm ethnically Jewish. Do I think there's Jewish race? No, I think it's bullshit. I don't buy it, I think it's destructive. But do I, I, do I love my, my heritage? Absolutely. Let's put it in a slightly different way, one more time, because it's so counterintuitive to so many people. Imagine going to West Africa 700 years ago, before the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and, and, you know, you talk to the locals and said, well, you're all black people here. I bet the locals would think, what are you nuts? No, we're Igbo, we're Fulani, we're Akan. This lumping together of diverse peoples. And ac actually Africa is a very good example because it's the most diverse place on earth. Uh, is it was a product of oppression. Okay. Thank you. And there's, we have, we're going to get to as many as we can because we have quite a few. Um, awesome. Another one, though, and because we have so many wonderful health professions programs, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more um, about uh, race in a medical context? Uh, specifically, the question was, can you elaborate on race, racialization in a medical setting as the patient and or medical practitioner? 
Well, there are two dimensions to that. One has to do with the way that racial beliefs, racial biases, racial anxieties, racial hatreds play into doctor-patient relationships. Now, we live in a culture that's saturated with race. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. So, of course, that's, that's part of it, right? Doctors will come with certain assumptions, and patients will come with certain assumptions. If one or the other falls into a racialized category that is not their own. And sometimes, you know, this is quite warranted. There is a really awful history of human experimentation on people of color, ex extending into pretty recent times. Um, so, you know, some of the anxieties about the, the COVID vaccine, I totally understand that. Um, but in medical science, there's too much taking race for granted. There really is too much. I mean, race is, re is regarded as a diagnostically significant category. Now, just as, as an aside, in other words, it's, it's routine medical procedure when I last heard to make a note of the race of the person, self-identified race. What does that mean biologically? Not much. Not much. You, you can't eyeball a person and know anything much, either about their ancestry or their genetic makeup. Um, and, and here I would refer the, um, the questioner to the work of Dorothy Roberts, one of the people who endorsed my last book, who has done wonderful work on the destructive role of of racial thinking in, in medicine. In fact, I brought her to UNE uh, some years ago. I used to have run an, an annual uh, lecture and I would just highly, highly recommend her book, uh, Fatal Invention, to really get the lowdown on, on, uh, on the destructive use of racial categories in medicine. If I can just, um, and th so this is me following up. Yeah my own question. Uh, so as we are having these community conversations at UNE um, that, 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 that Erica has been having for years and that yeah. I'm just starting to, to, to join, um, you know, we have very careful conversations about how we should not um, discount the impact of race. And, um, and specifically, uh, maybe even in a medical context, I'll speak about myself as a patient. I, yeah. I would not want for my physician to not realize that I'm a black man. Yeah. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I want to reconcile that thing that's really important to me. I, I, that's my identity. Yeah. With, with your scholarship and what you're um, speaking about. Yeah. So you you are right. So now here's you can use the word black man in lots of different ways. Like I say, I'm a Jewish man. Now, you might mean uh, that you are a particular type of human being that sets you apart from other types of human being in a, in a, in a fundamental biologically significant sense. And that's what you might mean by black. If that's the case, I, I would say I would like to encourage you not to think of it in that way. If you mean, I am an African-American man, perhaps a descendant of enslaved people from West Africa, then I think that's perfectly fine. But, and, and I know I run into a lot of opposition about this, the endorsement of race in that first sense, I just think is toxic. And I think every bit of our history shows it's toxic. Um, and I certainly would want your physician to be very cautious about drawing conclusions about your, your risks, your health risks, and the likelihood of you suffering from certain conditions on the basis of that identification. 
Thank you. My spouse, who's Jamaican and a philosopher of science, argues with her doctor <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> she says, well, you know, she says, well, black people are opponents. Sabrina says, don't give me that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and we can, we, we can, uh, I'll, I love, we'll continue the conversation because I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that part. Okay. Uh, well, we could have a good conversation. Absolutely. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, looking at our, our question and answer portion, um, Barb, one of our lovely librarians, would like to note, <clears throat> excuse me, that the UNE library has the ebook on humanity. Um, for anyone that wants to check that out, um, as, as David told us, you need to read the book. So read the book. Um, <laughs> our next question comes from one of our illustrious um, diversity leadership certificate grad and UNE alum and a current uh, U UNE College of Osteopathic Medicine student, Osawe Wagiran. Um, he said, uh, Dr. Livingstone Smith, thank you for taking this time to make such a great presentation. I enjoy reading your enlightening book, The Most Dangerous Animal, a few years ago. <laughs> My main question is, how can we further unify and humanize one another so people can stop seeing this issue as their issue instead of our issue? Yeah, you know, it's, it's so hard because it's so baked in, it's so pervasive in our culture. There's, uh, I think education is really important, I really do. Um, and, and not the kind of education which continually, inf that skips the, the horrors, which were not limited to the United States, so the colonial powers. Um, and not the kind of education that continually affirms race. We really need to open it up. People have a lot of misconceptions. I mean, you could, there are people, look, there are a lot of people who disagree with my take, who are really smart and really well informed. So I'm not saying they have misconceptions because they don't agree with me. This whole thing needs to be opened up and highlighted and properly addressed in our educational system. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the main feedback my students give repeatedly to me at the end of the course on my course on race and racism is, I'm so angry I was never taught this. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that some of the students would think I'm making this stuff up. That's why I do things like show documentary films. I have guests, uh, uh, African-American philosophers, uh, zooming into class to to, to talk to my students and, and so on. So that's so important. And they're just you know stumbling into this class because they needed the despised humanities credit, you know. Um, so there really needs to be much more concerted effort to, to address these things head on. But it's, it's something more, I mean, I always hear people saying, we need a conversation on race. So that conversation, no, that, that's, like another conversation, uh, it's got to be more substantial than that. I agree. I agree. Chris, would you like to take the next question? Sure, I certainly can. There, there's a, a, a menu of them to choose from. Uh, so let's go with, um, let's see, if And they're so they're they're so uh, detailed. All right, so let's let's go with this one from Desiree. If race and racism are inextricably linked, does that mean there is nothing good or positive to pre uh, to preserve from the concept of of race itself? Uh, asked another way, is it possible to separate the traditions, cultures, etc., based on race that we treasure? Uh, this questioner says, if I hear you correctly. Um, we are, are tainted because they are both born from race and inextricably linked to racism, tied to racism. Well, they're, they're tied historically, but yes, we can cherish those things. Yes, why not? We, cherish, we can cherish our, the good aspects of our, of our heritage. Um, 
our culture, our, all of those things. We, we just don't need the idea of race in there, right? So when my wife says she's, she's of Jamaican heritage, she doesn't need to say anything more than that. And part of that involves being, and here's a term I've used, but I haven't really defined it, being racialized, people racializing each other. People, you know, uh, one of my, my favorite philosophers, he hasn't received his PhD yet, is a, uh, a young African-American man. He, he's always coming into my classes. And uh, he's, he's a race skeptic like me. He's a grad student at Harvard. He's done wonderful work on something he calls white mindedness. Uh, I, 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 I would like everyone to, to hear his message. And he, he, he feels it's, it's like an assault being crammed into these, this category. Now that's part of the history, the history that people of color have been crammed into these categories. But that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean you have to take it on. You can resist. And it's not betraying anything or anyone to resist. That's a whole other, I think, <clears throat> conversation and lecture within itself. Yeah. Um, I would like to, to meet him one day. I, I generally um, see you all in the cafeteria right after he comes to visit your Oh, class. yeah. The, he's a tall, lanky guy with long dreads. And he's a black man. He kind of stands out sometimes. <laughs> yeah, he is. But let me tell you something really nice about you, uh, about you and he from his mouth. So we go to the cafeteria. We spend the day together. He comes to my classes, and then he guest teaches one of my classes. And goes to the cafeteria, gets his food. He comes back to the table and says, it's really remarkable. When I'm at, here at you and he, I feel like I'm just seen as another human being unlike University of Florida, <laughs> right? So that's, you know, thumbs up to you and either. Definitely. We appreciate everyone for coming in tonight. Um, we did go over a little over time because my introduction was a little, little meaty. I had to talk about Miss Georgia Gilmore. Um, I will give one plug. You all should be getting an email. All of our students, which is free of charge. I won't go into the details, um, but the diversity leadership certificate will begin very soon with myself, Dr. Heather Sadlier, and Ms. Jerry Huber. Um, but um, I do want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Please uh, log on to our forums on Friday and Friday at noon uh, with Dr. Chris Hunt, myself, and others um, talking about being human and being better humans. <laughs> Good. Right? Is that about right, Chris? <laughs> yeah, and Dr. King and his dreams and the nightmare. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Is it the dream or the nightmare? Um, but thank you all again for coming out tonight, and I wish you all a, a wonderful evening. Do, 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 do. every voice and sing to earth and heaven. Ring, ring.